Lehman Brothers, Washington Mutual, Bear Stearns. Anybody familiar with the financial crisis of 2008 immediately gets chills remembering the near collapse of the economy. It is frequently remarked that markets often take the stairs up and the elevator down, and it is on the way down that many individuals achieve successes that set them apart from everyone else. Now, if you follow the news or watch YouTube, you probably know that we are heading towards a recession. And yes, it may feel like doomsday is upon us, but the upcoming crisis may present a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's look back at the financial leaders that found opportunity where others only found disaster. The art of financial investment is as old as time. The art of profiting off of the misfortune of others is even older. For example, take Marcus Crassus, a notable Roman statesman of first century BC and considered to be the richest Roman of his time. Crassus founded his astounding wealth, estimated to be close to $20 billion in modern estimates, specifically owned the downturns of the market around him. Fighting against his political enemies, Crassus would buy their land at extremely low prices after exiling them from Rome. In this way, we see one of the oldest traditions of financial profiteering, and while the methods of acquiring wealth have gotten more discreet, the principles remain the same. With this in mind, let's examine some people from modern times who made the most money during previous financial crises and how they did it. Joseph Kennedy Sr. An American businessman and politician who was best known as the patriarch of the Kennedy family, Joseph Kennedy Sr. pursued a career in business and investing at a time when the Great Depression was just around the corner and prohibition was not yet in effect. His first job after graduating from Harvard was as a state-employed bank examiner, where he was later elected the bank's president at just 25 years of age. In 1923, Kennedy established his own investment company, where he became a multimillionaire as a result of taking short positions following the 1929 stock market crash. Before the 1929 Wall Street crash, Kennedy formed alliances with other Irish Catholic investors and established a stock pool in order to control trading of a particular stock. This arrangement would drive up the price of their friend's stock by using the public's lack of knowledge and insider information. This friend would then in turn bribe journalists to create more hype for a particular stock. In this way, Kennedy controlled the stock market through rampant stock speculation, which was common in the late 1920s, and he even knew that it wouldn't last for long. Supposedly, Kennedy once told his friends that he knew it was time to get out of the market when he received stock tips from a shoeshine boy. When the time did come to get out of the market, Kennedy's exit was swift and his sense of timing was marvelous, as the market collapsed on itself within a few days after his exit. Instead, Kennedy invested most of his funds into real estate, where he made a fortune. Before the Great Depression, Kennedy was worth $4 million, estimated to be $63.1 million today. And after it, by 1935, his wealth had increased to $180 million, estimated to be worth a whopping $3.56 billion today. Throughout his public life, many criminals boasted that they had worked with Kennedy in mysterious and illegal bootlegging operations, including Frank Costello and Al Capone. And while there is no truth to these stories, an interesting anecdote about Kennedy Sr. remains true. After it became clear that the prohibitions were about to end, Kennedy used his political connections to land exclusive contracts to import high-end scotch whiskey and gin from the UK. A decade later, he sold his liquor franchise for a staggering 100 million in today's dollars. Now that's a boss move, a completely legal one at that. Howard Hughes. The next one on our list is none other than the American business magnate, film director, investor, and philanthropist, Howard Hughes. When Leonardo DiCaprio portrays you in a film, you must have been some badass indeed. Hughes only inherited an estate worth about a million dollars from his father. His father's company initially sold rock picks during the gold rush, and once the oil rush started, he patented a drill that became astronomically successful. Howard would eventually sell the division, which had initially made him successful later in his life, where it would merge with Baker International to form Baker Hughes Co., which still remains one of the world's largest oil field service companies. Wanting to do something on his own, the young Howard Hughes embarked on a professional journey that lasted decades, and would eventually make him into one of the richest men of his time. Hughes was the father of influencer marketing, and he built his public image while pursuing his Hollywood dreams by producing several films, including the iconic original Scarface. From a young age, Hughes had shown a talent in science, technology, and especially aviation where his lifelong passion would lay. Remember the rock drill that Hughes's father had patented way back in 1909? Once massive oil reserves were found in Texas, it became the most valuable asset that Howard controlled, and it made him astronomically rich as he owned a 75% stake in his father's company. This came right after the Great Depression, when oil prices had been skyrocketing for almost a decade, and Saudi oil wouldn't be in the picture for at least another decade. Hughes's purchase in real estate were also forward-thinking, as he understood the value of Las Vegas for it became the city that we know it as today. Hughes extended his financial empire to include Las Vegas real estate, hotel, and media outlets, spending an estimated $300 million in order to take over many well-known hotels. 
In this way, he became one of the most powerful men in Las Vegas. Jamie Dimon. Dimon was born in New York City to a Greek immigrant family, and his rags to riches story is truly remarkable. As a kid, he apparently changed his last name from Papadimitro to Dimon because he had fallen in love with a French girl and wanted his name to sound French. After graduating, he worked in management consulting for the Boston Consulting Group and eventually enrolled at Harvard Business School, where he graduated in 1982, earning an MBA as a Baker Scholar. His friend and mentor, Sandy Weil, convinced him to turn down offers from Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Lehman Brothers in order to join him as an assistant at American Express. Although Weil could not offer the same amount of money that these other firms could, what he did promise Dimon was that he would have fun. Having his father already working at American Express, Dimon agreed to it. Sandy and Dimon would eventually leave for greener pastures and transition into a large financial services conglomerate called Citigroup, where Jamie would serve as CFO. In 1998, Dimon would leave Citigroup because of claims that he and Weil had had a falling out and they could no longer work together. In reality, the younger Dimon was ready to step out of his former mentor's shadow. By December 2005, Dimon was named CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, and a year later he would be named Chairman and President. During his tenure, J.P. Morgan would become the leading U.S. bank in the country, and Dimon was already being considered as a Top Gun CEO by many. After the financial crisis of 2008, J.P. Morgan remained one of the few banks that were not left reeling from the repercussions of the recession. But the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, was introduced by the U.S. government in order to provide relief and assistance to the struggling banks. J.P. Morgan was one of the few companies which was arguably considered to be the healthiest of the nine largest U.S. banks. Because of this, Dimon was allowed to continue his role atop the company hierarchy, where he received more than $115 million in salary alone from 2001 to 2015. Dimon's biggest break was when he was able to convince J.P. Morgan to acquire Bear Stearns for $10 a share, or roughly 15% of its value from March 2008. This was only possible because of its huge bets on U.S. housing that had brought many financial institutions to ruin. Due to this, he has remained widely successful and has become one of the few banking billionaires in the world. Warren Buffett The last person on our list is definitely the most worthy of the spot, being a business magnate who has been often referred to as the Oracle or Sage of Omaha. He is the myth, the legend, and one of the most successful investors in the world, Warren Buffett. Born in Omaha, Nebraska, Buffett displayed an interest in business and investing at a young age. Much of his early childhood was spent in business ventures, such as selling chewing gum, Coca-Cola bottle, and weekly magazines. He would do this door to door, a far cry from the acclaimed visionary he was to become. In high school, Buffett invested in a business owned by his father and bought a 40-acre farm. He was only 14 years old at the time and had saved up $1,200 for the purchase. By the time he had finished college in Nebraska, he had saved up $9,800 in savings, about $112,000 today. Early in his career, Buffett worked as an investment salesman, a security analyst, and ultimately as a general partner of Buffett Partnership, where he decided to make his own company. He was already a millionaire when he joined forces with Charlie Munger in 1962. Their collaboration resulted in the development of his investment philosophy. In the 1970s, Buffett would finally take over the role he has held to this day, the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, Inc. At the time of purchase, Berkshire Hathaway was a dying textile mill. Cash flows from the textile business funded other investments, but eventually Buffett shut down the textile business while keeping the name. He started to acquire the stocks of well-managed, undervalued companies such as Coca-Cola, American Express, and the Gillette Company, which had remained in Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio for many years. He had also purchased lesser-known firms such as Dairy Queen, Fruit of the Loom, and Geico Auto Insurance, which he allowed to be run by their own management teams in their day-to-day -day activities. So how did he make his money? By giving up the textile industry and turning completely to insurance, he invested in National Indemnity Company and Geico. By 1985, Berkshire Hathaway's stock had hit $5,000 per share, making him a billionaire. By 2006, Buffett had turned Hathaway into a behemoth with stock worth over $100,000 per share, proving that in the long run, patience pays off, along with sensible financial decisions, of course. Today, one Class A stock of Berkshire Hathaway is worth a mind-blowing amount of $423,700. As the market continues to head towards stark predictions, it is important to remember that it is never a bad time to invest, and as the examples have shown, even in the direst of circumstances, people can rise and achieve things that were thought to be impossible.